Among those who are present with us today, we're delighted to have a number of our university students, some of whom have graduated. We're proud of your progress. And we look forward later this month on the evening of the 21st to honor a large number, 15, of graduating high school seniors. I'm just curious, how many of you, when you see or hear these two words, ask not, you can finish a sentence from a famous speech delivered by a United States president. I want you to look around. These are the people who were around in 1961. <laughs> Over 56 years ago, when John F. Kennedy spoke these words, I was a mere lad of five. It's amazing to see the spirit of volunteerism in this church. Yesterday morning, some of you came together and helped one of our families move from one home to another. At the same time, there was a crowd back in the FLC working on curriculum and getting pre ready for the new quarter to begin in June. Then the memorial service for Wanda Hollingsworth. I particularly noted a woman that again and again organizes the food for such events. Another sister in Christ who put together the video and helped the family set everything up and met them here on a Friday afternoon. A deacon who changed his schedule with his family so that he could be here to run the video. And one of our newest members, a sister who did not even know Wanda Hollingsworth, who came to the kitchen early on and stayed all the way through the meal serving and then helped to clean up. Today, the blood drive is upon us. And I'd like to use it as an illustration. I realize not everyone can give blood. Some of you don't weigh enough. I have a suggestion for you. Why not come and support those who can give and eat all the cookies? And maybe next time around, you'll be eligible. Many of us, when we need blood, we assume that there's a blood bank and that there's whatever we need available and ready for us. And we might ask, what will the blood bank do for me? Someone out there is giving, someone cares, someone shares, someone takes their time at no benefit except maybe some cookies and the feeling that they've served someone else. And then we can go and draw, shall we say, from that supply. If we turn that around and we say, what can I do for the blood bank? For someone else that might be sick or dying or need a transfusion, it's a complete reversal and helps us to put ourselves in a different position and give us a fresh perspective. There are so many among us who are already asking, what can I do for the church? And you're jumping in, you're involved, and I'm more excited than I've ever been with this congregation as you and I witness such a tremendous fervor for the kingdom of God. Today I want to challenge all of us to ask that question. And if we've not found our spot to do so, and let our elders and deacons and others assist you so that that question, what do you do for the Lord's Church in Keller, you can give a resounding and enthusiastic and solid answer. Yes, it was in 1961, President John F. Kennedy said, and so my fellow Americans, ask not, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And if you weren't around in 1961, or you were just a child, look up that speech. It's challenging. It's encouraging. It's a call for service. In that speech, he also said, let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. 
Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. And regarding our nation's enemies, we dare not tempt them with weakness. For only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. Wow. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than in mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answer the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again. Not a call to arms, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out. Then he quoted the scripture, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, from Romans 12. A struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country could do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Where did he get that famous line a book came out in 2011 by Chris Matthews that says Mr. Kennedy plagiarized. That when he went to Harvard College, there was a dean who spoke to all the students who said regarding their alma mater, their school, ask not what she can do for you, but rather what you can do for her. And it said that whenever this line was attributed to JFK, those of his classmates cringed because they knew the original source of it, which I'm convinced was not original because the Savior said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Ask not what I can receive. Ask what I can give. Some years later, in President H.W. Bush's inaugural address, 1989, he spoke of a thousand points of light, community organizations spread like stars throughout the country doing good, working hand in hand, promoting the ideas of duty and sacrifice, commitment, of patriotism that finds its expression in taking part and pitching in. And he may have plagiarized himself because in the State of the Union speech, he spoke of meaning and reward, serving a higher purpose than ourselves, a shining purpose, the illumination of a thousand points of light. We all have something to give. Now, I want you to imagine if every person had taken Kennedy's words to heart and decided to contribute, to share, to participate, and make our country great. What kind of land we would live in today? Doesn't that stagger the imagination? Or in 1989, if Bush's words had sunk into the hearts of every citizen of this land and all would be looking not to take but to give, not to lean but to lift, not to drain but to supply? It's because these ideas need to be repeated again and again and again that one leader after another will shout the very same call echoing those who have gone before. Where did Mr. Bush get that line? You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You don't put it under a bowl or under a basket. You set it high so all the world can see it. And Mr. Bush could imagine that lights here and here and here all over from coast to coast would illuminate the United States of America. Ask not. Oh, we are consumers, we're customers, we're shoppers. We go into a store, we're trained this way by our culture looking to get the most by giving the least. We shop for price and we shop for quality. If we don't like what we see, we move on down the road. No stake, no commitment, nothing pledged. If we find a better deal, we can return the first item. And what 
can I get? But if you put yourself in the other spot in the store, there are those who are part of the success of that venture. Maybe they're employees, or maybe they're managers, maybe they're associates, maybe it's the owner of the store. And this isn't something that he just goes in and out and says, hey, I think there's something I'll take here. This is that in which he invests himself or she herself because the progress and the effectiveness of that business depend upon someone saying, I'm going to give, I'm going to share, I'm going to make the effort so that this can be the very best it can be. Today, I encourage myself and all of us to ask not what the church can do for me, but to ask what I can do for the church. Now, in Mark chapter 10, as Jim read so effectively, I'm thankful he started with verse 34 because really this interaction with James and John is sandwiched between two passages that highlight the contrasting nature of the Lord Jesus Christ in comparison with the two of them. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. What's he not asking? And what is he asking? What can I do for the sins, the burdens, the fears, the doubts, the troubles of other people? I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be flogged, crowned with thorns, clothed with a purple robe. I'm going to be nailed to a wooden cross. He's asking not what others can do for him. He's asking what he can do for you and for me. So as you look at that passage in Mark 10... Join me in asking yourself some questions that might help us personalize this truth. My first question is, now you fill in the blank, what can you do for me? Or is it what can I do for you? Is it what can others do for me? Or what can I do for others? What can the church do for me? Or what can I do for the church? I'd rather give than receive or no. To be honest, some might say I'd rather take than let go of something I have. I'd rather share than borrow. Or I'd rather borrow than share. I seek to serve. That's what Jesus said. Not to be served. I seek to offer something, not ask for something. I am other-centered, not self-centered. I am Christ-centered, God-centered, mission-centered, church-centered. I want last place, not first place. Place. That's the issue with those who were following Jesus. And the other ten were indignant. Why? Because James and John beat them to the front of the line. I want to be here. I want to be here. And I read that and I say, oh, am I ever like that? Are you? And it speaks to me. It confronts me. And for Jesus to say the last will be first, he that wants to be great is to be the least Even the Son of Man, who should have been served, didn't come for that purpose, but to serve and to give himself a ransom for many. I prefer to visit. I don't have to be visited. I prefer to make the phone call. I'm not going to sit there just waiting for somebody else to call me. And how about this one? I pass or I fail the sheep test. What's the, she- what's the sheep test? Well, you know it well. It's in Matthew 25. It's that judgment scene in which Jesus described two groups of people separated at the last day. And he tells those on his right whom he calls the sheep 
I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison. You fed me. You gave me drink. You welcomed me and clothed me, visited me. You came to me. This is the sheep test. It's an ask not test. When we see the word I, it's easy to put ourselves in the picture. When I'm hungry, I want somebody to feed me. When I'm thirsty, I'd love a person to offer me a glass of water. If I'm a stranger, I'm a newcomer in the church. It's the first time I walk into this room. I like to be greeted and made to feel at home. Or if I had no clothes, oh, I'd be cold and I'd want someone to share. Or if I was sick, I would love to be visited. If I were in prison, to know that someone cared and made the effort to reach out to me like many of our ladies do with the ladies prison ministry and many others that send cards and offer up prayers for them. Jesus changes the I to himself. And when he tells these who are before him, you did this for me, it puts it in a whole new light. Now I'm not just asking, what can I do for so-and-so? What can I do for Jesus? And suddenly, it rises above the behavior of other people. Did they do their share? I'm doing it for Jesus. Did they reciprocate? Did they appreciate? I'm doing this for Jesus. And when the sheep say, when did we ever see you, Lord, in that circumstance and do this for you? He said, inasmuch as, or to the degree that, you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. Ask not what someone else can do for you. Ask what you can do for Jesus by doing it for the least. And then he tells them, come, you blessed, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you. I want to pass that sheep test, and I know you do too. Well, let's think of some other examples. A moment ago, we were in Mark chapter 10. What happens just after that? We said before these two came and asked for prominence, Jesus explained what he was about to give up on behalf of others. Just after that, walking down the road that goes to Jericho, there's a blind beggar, Bartimaeus. And we've talked about him just recently in a lesson that says, Arise and follow Christ. But here I want us to notice that Jesus asked this man by the side of the road. He asked not, what will you do for me? He asked, what do you want me to do for you? Meanwhile, the crowd, they've tried to shush this man. He's loud. He's interrupting our travels, our time with the Lord. Quiet him down. (laughs) And to his credit, he won't be silenced. And I think how easy it is for any one of us to be part of that crowd. And we're asking what Jesus will do for me, what he has in store, what's coming, what blessings there are. And Jesus stops everybody and says, that's not the question. The question is, what do you want me to do for you? If you turn a couple more pages in Mark 14, here's a woman with precious oil. She breaks an alabaster vial and she pours out the perfume on Jesus and the fragrance fills the house and the disciples begin to complain. Oh, it could have been sold and the money given to the poor. And then the next verse, Judas Iscariot went out to negotiate with the leaders as to how much they would pay him to hand over the Savior. What a
contrast. She, what can I give? Judas, what can I get? Oh, and then in Acts 4, side by side with chapter 5, here are people in the early church that are losing their homes, their support, their food, their jobs. And individuals like Joseph, called Barnabas, the son of encouragement, come forward. And what are they asking and what are they not asking? Barnabas is asking, in effect, what do I have that you need? We're a community. We're a family. If one is hungry, we, we all feel it. If one is bereaved, if one is hurting, if one is sick, that affects all of us. And then Ananias and Sapphira apparently asking the other question, what can I get out of this? Because they deceitfully, without words, lie to the Holy Spirit, to God, about the proceeds coming from the sale of their land. In 2 Corinthians 8, there are the Macedonians living in the northern part of Greece. The Corinthians are in Achaia in the south. And Paul uses the Macedonians to spur on, to stir up the Corinthians in their giving. Look at that passage with me. Because it's amazing who asked whom for what. You might think, oh, I know, Paul asked the Macedonians to help the poor saints in Judea. Paul says there was a different question. In verse 2, he mentions their great ordeal of affliction and their deep poverty. But in the same statement, their abundance of joy and the wealth of their liberality. Here were people that had little and shared it. Those that were facing hardship and duress and yet they reached beyond themselves. Verse 3, they gave according to their ability, beyond their ability of their own accord. Now look at verse 4, who is asking whom? Jumps out at the page. It's not Paul begging the Macedonians to share in this great need. It's the Macedonians begging, urging, may we participate. We don't have much, but we'd like for others to have it. Ask not what the people in Judea can do for us. Ask instead, what can we do for our brothers and sisters in Judea? When Jesus went to the cross, here are the soldiers. What are they doing? Gambling over his clothes. What's their question? What's in it for me? What can I get from this? And here, the creator of the universe, God the Son in flesh, is asking a different question. Philippians chapter 2, the mind of Christ. That whole chapter urges us to ask not the one, but instead to ask the other. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. That's the ask not. But with humility, regard others as more important than yourself. That's the ask. Ask not just for your own personal interest, but the interest of others. Ask, like Jesus did, how can I empty myself? Rather than, how can I exalt myself? Oh, in those words, do all things without grumbling and disputing. I wonder if grumbling and disputing are the result of asking the wrong question. If I'm asking everybody else out there to do for me what I expect, what I assume, what I think ought to be done, and then they don't measure up, I'm going to grumble. I'm going to complain. I, I'm going to tell somebody else, just like the customer in the store. 
who doesn't think he was treated fairly or got the best deal. And then Paul says, you're to be blameless, shining forth like lights in the universe. That sounds like President Bush. A thousand points of light holding fast the word of truth that I may know I did not run in vain. And if we had time, we'd talk about Timothy. Paul said, I have no one else like him who's genuinely concerned for the interest of other people. Ask not, but ask. Epaphroditus risked his life to bring a gift from the Philippians to Paul in Rome because of the question that they asked. Colossians 1, 24 and following. Paul notes, if you'll turn there, I rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf because I do my part to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. You say, wait a minute. Christ suffered it all. The debt has been paid. Kent led us in the song today about being soldiers of the cross, rising up as men and women of God because there is a battle yet to be won. There's a war in which we are still engaged. And the Christian looks at it that Christ suffered for the church. How can I be like Christ? We've noted in our Roman study, Romans 8, 29, that God wants us to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. It seems to me that this shows Paul and each of us to be conformed to the image of Christ. In chapter 2, he goes on to speak of a great struggle. It's the Greek word from which we get our word agony. We might say that Paul is agonizing over Christians, that their hearts may be encouraged and knit together in love, that they may reach all the full assurance because of their faith. Sometime back, a brother who is no longer with us, hasn't been for some time, he and I were talking about a new Wednesday night class I was going to present on the book of Acts. And he told me very Bluntly and honestly, there would be nothing presented in that class that would be new to him. He had studied Acts. He understood Acts. He knew the message of Acts. My response was, would you come and help me help others understand Acts? You see, I think sometimes we look at the church and we say, oh, that class, that teacher, that preacher, that series, I, I don't think I'm going to get that much out of it. Yeah, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I, I think I'll stay home because it, it's not going to do that much for me. What if we change the question? What could I do for someone else? by actively participating in the studies and the assemblies of God's people. This passage challenges me, thank you. It challenges all of us. I go back to this again and again, and I'm not where I need to be. But when I see among us those that have this spirit of volunteerism, I think, hey, I see Christ in you. I'm thankful for you. You help me. You help all those around you because you're asking a different question. The question Jesus asked was not, how can others enrich me? It was, how can I become poor to enrich others? will never be in every way exactly like Him. It's a process. It's a journey. 
But I know you and I want to draw closer than we ever have before. In Luke 14, Jesus noted how people were seeking the first place, places when they came to the banquet. Isn't that just the way we often are? And he said, you know, if you take the prominent spot, the host is going to come and say, I'm sorry, we have someone else that that's reserved for. You move to the back and you'll be humiliated. Jesus said, just go to the back when you come in. And the host will say, hey, come on up here. And the irony is the person that's asking that other question, Jesus said, the least becomes the greatest, the last becomes the first, and the servant becomes the one served. Today we close with this question. What could God do with every person in this room as a point of light? If we ask not, what can the church do for me, but what can I do for the church? We're here because the way Jesus answered that question was at Golgotha. When he bore our sins in his body on the tree. And it is that gift that enables, that inspires, that moves us on to want to follow Him. Today, you have the opportunity, as each time we gather, to confess your conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He's going to be your Lord. To turn from your past and your sin and be united with Him in a watery grave, baptism, and come forth to start anew. And to ask that question that He asked and to live it out in your life every day. If we can encourage you in any way, won't you come? Let's stand and sing.